Good evening and welcome to evening prayer for Tuesday, July 7th. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Joyous light of glory of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ, we have come to the setting of the sun, and we look to the evening light. We sing to God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. Praise to you, O Christ. O come, let us worship him. Lord Jesus, stay with us for the evening is at hand and the day is past. Be our constant companion on the way. Kindle our hearts and awaken hope among us, that we may recognize you as you are revealed in the scriptures and in the breaking of the bread. Grant this for your name's sake. Amen. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage, and the ends of the earth your possession. Excuse me just a second. My mouth is so dry, I am sticking to the roof of my mouth. Sorry about this. I can't stop and start it again. Our New Testament reading this evening is from the book of Acts, uh, chapter 13, picking up uh, where it left off yesterday at verse 13. Now Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia. And John left them and returned to Jerusalem. But they went on from Pergia, Perga and came to Antioch in Pisidia. And on the Sabbath day they went into the synagogue and sat down. After reading from the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them, saying, Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. So Paul stood up and, motioning with his hand, said, Men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. The God of this people Israel chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with uplifted arm he led them out of it. And for about forty years he put... he put up with them in the wilderness. And after destroying seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave them their land as an inheritance. All this took 450 years. And after he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. And they asked for a king, and God gave them Saul the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for forty years. And when he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified and said, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who will do all my will. Of this man's offspring, God had brought to Israel a Savior, Jesus, as he promised. Before his coming, John had proclaimed a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And as John was finishing his course, he said, What do you suppose that I am? I am not he. No, but behold, after me one is coming, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. Brothers, sons of the family of Abraham, and those among you who fear God, to us has been sent the message of this salvation. For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not recognize him nor understand the utterances of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled them by condemning him. And though they found in him no guilt worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. And when they had carried out all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb, but God raised him from the dead, and for many days he appeared to those who had come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to the people. 
And we bring you the good news that what God has promised to the fathers, this he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus. As also it is written in the second psalm, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And as for the fact that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption, he has spoken in this way, I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. Therefore he says also in another psalm, You will not let your holy one see corruption. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep, and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up did not see corruption. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and by him everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest what is said in the prophets should come about. Look, you scoffers, be astounded and perish, for I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe, even if one tells it to you. A couple quick comments about that uh, reading from Acts. Uh, of course, the first psalm quote, You are my son, today I have begotten you, is from today's psalm that we just, just spoke. And the other one, uh, You will not let your holy one seek corruption. That was the day before? Six... Um, no, I think that was the, that was the, uh, in, was that the intro? We just read that one a couple days ago. So there's a reason they tie these Psalms to the, the course of the readings in this uh, devotional book, is they, they should be related to each other in some way. And one phrase um, you may not know, when it says, uh, to the effect of, uh, you know, you children of Abraham and those of you who fear God. Or here in uh, verse 16 where he said, Men of Israel and you who fear God. And like, don't the men of Israel fear God? The term uh, God-fearer is a term that was used for non-Jewish followers of the one true God. So whether you would call them Gentiles who became Jews or... Uh, I don't know that they were actually called Jews then after they convert... Um, and Jewish people don't like the word conversion in any way. Uh, but a God-fearer is someone who believes in the God of Israel. Um, they believe everything that is in, in the Bible, just like the Jewish people, but they are not of Jewish heritage. So uh, they, Paul would be talking to a lot of God-fearers uh, in Antioch as he gets further from Jerusalem. You know, you're going to see more and more people uh, in the synagogues who are not Jewish by birth, but Jewish by by this God-fearing, by, by this adopting that religion as their own. Let's see, our Book of Concord reading tonight is the very last part of the Sacrament of the Altar, uh, which then concludes the large catechism. We'll finish it, which that's a pretty large, uh, pretty large thing to read. The next thing we're going to do definitely is going to be the small called articles and the what is called the treatise on the power and primacy of the Pope, which is kind of an appendix uh, to uh, to the uh, small called articles, uh, which was also by Luther. So when we finish that, we'll have finished everything in our Book of Concord that Martin Luther wrote, and then we'll move on to something else. But the uh, small called articles is probably the most mature Luther writing. He wrote it near the end of his life uh, for a church council, uh, like you've heard of Vatican II. It was going to be the Council of Small Called, uh, but it did not happen. Uh, but nonetheless, he wrote this, and uh, we put it in our Book of Concord. So we'll start that tomorrow evening, and we'll be in that for probably a couple of weeks. Okay, I'm going to back up to paragraph uh, 64, I think. Oh. Uh, Yeah, I'm going to back up just two short paragraphs before we pick up where we're at today. In the second place, there is besides this command also a promise, the command to take, eat, take, drink. This ought most strongly to stir, stir us up and encourage us, for here stand the kind and precious words, This is my body which is given for you, this is my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. These words I have said are not preached to wood and stone, but to me and you. Otherwise... Christ might just as well be silent and not institute a sacrament. 
Therefore, consider and read yourself into this word, you, so that he may not speak to you in vain. Here he offers to us the entire treasure that he has bought for us from heaven. With the greatest kindness, he invites us to receive it also in other places, like when he says in St. Matthew 11:28, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. It is surely a sin and a shame that he so cordially and faithfully summons and encourages us to receive our highest and greatest good, yet we act so distantly toward it. We permit so long a time to pass without partaking of the sacrament that we grow quite cold and hardened, so that we have no longing or love for it. Now, Luther is speaking right there to his own time, uh, where people had gotten these funny notions of you only have to go to the Lord's Supper every so often. Again, keep in mind, before Luther, they thought this was something you did for God. The sacrament was a sacrament because you did it, not because God said so. Uh, it, they had it totally backwards. And then even uh, when Luther began uh, reforming the church, people still maintained, you know, it's kind of like kind of like how we Lutherans are. Well, why do you do it that way? Because that's the way we always did it. And change was very, very difficult, especially with things like that. You know, you know yourselves, we changed our communion practice during this virus. And it's the best we can do under the circumstances. Is it ideal? No. Do we like it? No. And it was hard to get with the program, all of us, me included, because that's not how we do it, and we don't like this. So that's the same thing he's speaking to here, is the people that were staying away because, one, they didn't know better, and then, two, even when they were being taught, you have to get some momentum behind it. Uh, keeping in mind the catechism was written in 1529. Yeah, the large and small catechisms came out in 1529, so from, from the uh, 95 Theses to the large catechism was... Uh, what is that then? 23, 20, 29. Try this again. 15, 3, 20, 32 years. Uh, 32 years. That's not right. <laughs> 15, 17, 15, 29. That's 12 years. So this is 12 years between when the church started reforming to Luther writing this. So that 12 years had passed, people still have some funny notions that he's trying to to get rid of. And I just spent probably too much time on that. But uh, So now they grow quite cold and hardened, he's to saying to them, that they have no uh, longing or love, and he's trying to change that. They picks back up. We must never think of the sacrament as something harmful from which uh, we had better flee, but as a pure, wholesome, comforting remedy that grants salvation and comfort. It will cure you and give you life in both body and soul. For where the soul has recovered, the body also is relieved. Why, then, do we act as if the sacrament were a poison, the eating of which would bring death? To be sure, it is true that those who despise the sacrament and live in an unchristian way receive it to their hurt and damnation. And that's in 1 Corinthians 11, 29 and 30. Nothing shall be good or wholesome for them. It is just like a sick person who, on a whim, eats and drinks what is forbidden to him by the doctor. But those who are mindful of their weakness desire to be rid of it and long for help. They should regard and use the sacrament just like a precious antidote against the poison that they have in them. Here in the sacrament you are to receive from the lips of Christ forgiveness of sin. It contains and brings with it God's grace and the Spirit with all his gifts, protection, shelter, and power against death and the devil and all misfortune. So you have from God both the command and the promise of the Lord Jesus Christ. Besides this, from yourself, you have your own distress, which is around your neck. Because of your distress, this command, invitation, and promise are given. This ought to move you, for Christ himself says, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Matthew 9.12 In other words, he means those who are weary and heavy laden with their sins, with the fear of death, temptations of the flesh and of the devil. If therefore you are heavy laden and feel your weakness, then go joyfully to the sacrament and receive refreshment, comfort, and strength. If you wait until you are rid of such burdens, so that you might come to the sacrament pure and worthy, you must stay away forever. In that case, Christ pronounces sentence and says, If you are pure and godly, 
you have no need of me, and I, in turn, no need of you. Therefore, the only people who are called unworthy are those who neither feel their weakness nor wish to be considered sinners. But if you say, what then shall I do if I cannot feel such distress or experience hunger and thirst for the sacraments? Answer, for those who are of such a mind that they do not realize their condition, I know no better counsel than that they put their hand into their shirt to check whether they have flesh and blood. And if you find that you do, then go, for it is for your good. To St. Paul's epistle to the Galatians, hear what sort of a fruit your flesh is. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. Therefore, if you cannot discern this, at least believe the scriptures. They will not lie to you, and they know your flesh better than you yourself. Yes, St. Paul further concludes in Romans 7.18, I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. If St. Paul may speak this way about his flesh, we cannot assume to be better or more holy than him. But the fact that we do not feel our weakness just makes things worse. It is a sign that there is a lepro leprous flesh in us that can't feel anything. And yet, the leprosy rages and keeps spreading. That, that's actually true, uh, even in modern days, in, in some uh, uh, poor-to-do uh, parts of the world where there is still leprosy. One of the signs of leprosy is you can poke them like in the arm with a knife, and they will feel absolutely nothing. The flesh is uh, completely dead of feeling. Uh, if you ever want to read about it, it, the actual name for leprosy of that nature is uh, called Hansen's disease, and there's a good Wikipedia article about it. Uh, as we have said, if you are quite dead to all sensibility, still believe the scriptures which pronounce sentence upon you. In short, the less you feel your sins and infirmities, the more reason you have to go to the sacrament to seek help and a remedy. And that's what's so great about Luther is, you know, that really is a common thing that we feel sometimes like, oh, I, I, I shouldn't go to the Lord's Supper, I'm not worthy, or I, I, I'm i not quite prepared. In other words, not, not that you haven't examined yourself and felt that you're a sinner, you feel you're too much of a sinner, uh, and that you don't deserve to go. Uh, in that case, as Luther's teaching us, that means you need to go, you should go. That is what it is for. In the second place, look around you. See whether you are also in the world, or if you do not know it, ask your neighbors about it. If you are in the world, do not think that there will be lack of sins and misery. Just begin to act as though you would be godly and cling to the gospel. See whether no one will become your enemy, and furthermore do you harm, wrong, and violence, and likewise give you cause for sin and vice. If you have not experienced this, then let scripture tell you about it, which everywhere give this praise and testimony about the world. Beside this, you will also have the devil about you. You will not entirely tread him underfoot, because our Lord Christ himself could not entirely avoid him. Now, what is the devil? Nothing other than what the scriptures call him, a liar and a murderer, John 8.44. He is a liar to lead the heart astray from God's word and to blind it, so that you cannot feel your distress or come to Christ. He is a murderer who cannot bear to see you live one single hour. If you could see how many knives, darts, and arrows there are every moment aimed at you, you would be glad to come to the sacrament as often as possible. But there is no reason why we walk about so securely and carelessly, except that we neither think nor believe that we are in the flesh and in this work wicked world or in the devil's kingdom. Therefore, try this and practice it well. Be sure to examine yourself. 1 Corinthians 11.28, or look about you a little and just keep to the scriptures. If even then you still feel nothing, you have even more misery to regret both to God and to your brother. Then take this advice and have others pray for you. Do not stop until the stone is removed from your heart. Then indeed the distress will not fail to become clear, and you will find that you have sunk twice as deep as any other poor sinner. You are much more in need of the sacrament against the misery which, unfortunately, you do not see. With God's grace, you may feel your misery more and become hungrier for the sacrament, especially since the devil doubles his force against you. 
He lies in wait for you without resting so that he can seize and destroy you, soul and body. You are not safe from him for one hour. How soon he can have you brought suddenly into misery and distress when you least expect it. Let this, then, be said for encouragement, not only for those of us who are old and grown, but also for the young people who ought to be brought up in the Christian doctrine and understanding. Then the Ten Commandments, the Creed, and the Lord's Prayer might be taught to our youth more easily. They would receive them with pleasure and seriousness, and so they would use them from their youth and get used to them. For the old are now nearly past this opportunity. So these goals and others cannot be reached unless we train the people who are to come after us and succeed us in our office and work. We should do this in order that they also may bring up their children successfully, so that God's word in the Christian church may be preserved. Therefore, let every father of a family know that it is his duty by God's order and command to teach these things to his children, or to have the children learn what they ought to know. Since the children are baptized and received into the Christian church, they should also enjoy this communion of the sacrament, in order that they might serve us and be useful to us. They must all certainly help us to believe, love, pray, and fight against the devil. And that concludes the section on the sacrament of the altar, as well as complete the large catechism. We join in the Apostles' Creed in the Lord's Prayer. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, we praise your fathomless mercy with which you take pity on sinful men. All the prophets and apostles preach this to us in your holy word. Let our hope not be put to shame when we pray to you for all who suffer at this time. For behold, the evil foe has become mighty, and the great ones of this world rule often with unrighteousness. O God, who in former times caused your saints to overcome injustice, strengthen also today all who would stand in need of your help. Grant that all the prisoners of war, held as slaves in sacrifices of earthly wrath, may return to their home. Stand by all refugees and homeless people and be their justice. Be a father to the widows and orphans with your strong protection. Go through bars and fences to those who are imprisoned for the sake of your name. Strengthen them for a good witness, and let them not waver in the confession of your name. Teach us, through their example and the example of so many holy martyrs, to be ever watchful of the confession of your Son's name. Let us not be put to shame when the evil foe lays his hand on us. But if it is your will that we be persecuted for confessing Jesus as our Lord and only Savior, then support us in your grace, that we may withstand all trials, and grant us peaceful rest. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Merciful Lord, you sent Paul and Barnabas to preach the gospel in the synagogue of Pisidian Antioch and announce that Jesus is the Messiah, the Holy One, whose resurrection shows us that he will not see corruption. May our union with him in holy baptism Give us peace and comfort in being incorruptible, even as he is incorruptible. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. 
For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good night.